a little bit more about the math before we go in. So the important thing about the math is that there's this thing called invariant. Invariant is just a constant. A constant that doesn't change, like duh, it's called constant. And the thing, the thing about this beautiful math of AMMs, which is a little bit different from the other token bonding curves, is that it, it has this effect of, it has this very interesting effect of something being constant. Right now, it's good that we are more in a closed loop system in Nexus Mutual, and we can look at how do we align incentives of the different agents to get the truth out through voting. And we talked about this previously in the last episode about principal agent misalignment or incentive misalignment, and maybe in Nexus Mutual, that can be resolved with tokens. So using tokens as a way to incentivize behaviors so that we can align incentives for the principal and agent. So the principal and agent will be the risk assessors and the members who bought the covers. So how does it work? Firstly, the claim assessor has to stick some NXM tokens. Then they will behave in... The, the behavior is to either vote yes or no for the claims. Then the advisory board will determine if the behavior of these assessors. So the assessors will determine the behavior of the smart contract, and then the advisory board will determine the behavior of these risk assessors. If they are behaving well, it's all fine and good, then they will get some tokens back as returns, as, as a reward for participating. But if they behave badly, then the tokens will be burned or the tokens will be locked up. So that's where you know the claim assessors get a share of the, the fee, or you know, if, the, if you're making a good decision, then you get a share of it, you get some fees or you get some tokens, extra tokens. If you behave badly, then your tokens will be locked up for a, for a while. So you can't use the tokens, but you still have the tokens. You know, it's like a punishment so to incentivize you to behave well. And if you behave fraudulently, so you are cheating, then your tokens will be burnt. The economic utility. When I talk about utility, it's, it's not utility token, it's more of the, the economic utility, the economic benefits that, is, that the token has in the system or the system brings about to users. Two things. The first one is that there is long-term sustainability to internalize volatility from price to units. Simple words. It means that when there is fluctuation in prices, you don't see the fluctuation in secondary market, so it will not affect your business transactions. However, what will it do? It will change the unit of OMT tokens that you have. So this is, this is good because when you, when you externalize, so when you don't internalize volatility, you externalize, that's where your token prices will go up and down like crazy. When you internalize them, then your token prices can be a bit more stable, which is what they want. This is very important for day-to-day -day use cases because you don't want your value of goods or your value to be fluctuating crazily. Firstly, it's a community-first approach. You realize that everything in the crypto space, everything in the DeFi space, is very much community-focused. That means everything that is done is done for the community first. If the community doesn't have any adoption, there's no mass adoption, then this system just doesn't take off because the market decides, the market, which is the community, decides that this adds zero economic value and I'm not using it. So we are shifting, it's a very good shift when we are moving all these systems to the blockchain platform because we're going to look at community community first approach. So this is something like, you know, a, pro, a product market fit. You want to find product market fit first before you start building your beautiful pitch deck and realize that, oh, the market actually doesn't want it. So the entire community of first approach, especially in insurance, is how do you assess the different risk? How do you allocate the risk properly? How do you reward people who are willing to take on the risks? So these are community first. Governance, unless they have really strong opinions. And uh, yeah, the voices of them will be um, like, um, maybe they, they will prefer to delegate their powers to uh, to someone else. Um, well, maybe delegation uh, explicitly allowed, uh, if explicitly allowed, will be probably a good solution to that because uh, if 
if delegation is not explicitly allowed, then there are there will be money managers who try to to pull the tokens and then they vote on behalf of people. Uh, and maybe people would, would have chosen somebody else to express their voice than asset managers who manage their monetary value. So uh, maybe maybe this the delegation could actually be um, could actually be a solution, but then it kind of um, shifts more like towards uh, so, so, like in, in like a financial system, you you give assets to some asset management company and they they vote on your behalf. But uh, here it could be probably a little bit more like a, a political system where you give a vote to I don't know some representative who represents uh, your vote and they maybe don't manage your money. But uh, uh, so, so that's probably good. But then it kind of comes down to uh, to some PR and whatever uh, to uh, for for those. Um, token politicians. In the most fundamental starting point, token economics is about managing the supply and demand of tokens while consider considering the opportunity cost of doing so. Demand can always be created. As the designer of the ecosystem and token, it is important to think of the use cases and the value add that the token can bring. This defines the demand of the tokens. The more use cases and value add it brings to the users, the more sustainable the demand is. So this is a decision that I have to make. And in economics, it's, just, it's all about decision. It's all about making decisions, right? So making decisions are your behaviors. We want to understand how, how do people behave and what can we do to affect this behavior? And this is where, this is where rewards come in. Yes, we all like rewards, right? Rewards are basically incentives. And this is very good. So you want to decide between being a validator or liquidity provider. Well, there's nothing that's free in the world. You can't just get rewards by not doing anything. We do something. We do something by staking. So if you are a validator, you have to stake tokens. And if you're a liquidity provider, you have to provide liquidity, which is a different kind of staking. So this, this is the decision you make. Do I stake or do I provide liquidity? Now, how do we decide? Other than all the different risks that you're considering, one of the ways to decide is, in a very objective way, is to look at incentives, which are your rewards. And now the system has two forms of rewards. You have rewards to liquidity providers and rewards to validators. So if you think about it, you have a big, you have a big bowl of rewards or presents, because it's Christmas time. And then you have you can either put all the rewards inside here, so you can be total rewards, and then you allocate it every time someone does something good. So every time a validator does something good, you give rewards to validator. If every time a liquidity provider does something good, you give rewards to liquidity providers from this reward pool. In general, yes, you can do that. You can, you can combine them together. But if you look deeper into the whole mechanism that we'll talk about a bit later, what you want to do is that instead of one big box, you cut it into half. So half is for liquidity providers, one is for validators. So the, all the rewards inside here will only be given to liquidity providers and all the rewards inside here will only be given to validators because they're separate. Why are they separate? Because they exist on two different ecosystems. They're two very separate things that we want to encourage the two very different behaviors, two very out different outcomes to the behaviors. And that is why we have to separate their rewards into two big segments, into two separate segments. Yes, everyone talks about governance token. I still have no idea how to price governance token because it's kind of like a mix of discounted cash flow plus some form of voting equity-like structure. It's still very complicated. A lot of people are using governance token and governance token as a way to give reason for the existence of native tokens. That makes sense, okay? What I, would what I would suggest is to have a clearer use case for it. Why do I say so? So for, for example, some, some assets, some protocols have governance token for a good use case. I think Nexus Mutual makes sense because Nexus Mutual, the whole company structure is a mutual. And for mutual to exist, you need different, you need decentralized participants and decentralized governance. So the whole idea of NXM as a governance token, it makes complete sense to me and it, it's intuitive, right? It makes sense. There's a 
pretty clear defined use case for it. So where does the value of bonding curve come from? The intrinsic value is that these users, these token holders, are entitled to some form of future cash flow that's brought in by the system. It's quite similar to how Compound and, and um, DYDX and Balancer and all these different tokens have in place, where you are entitled to some future cash flow that is generated by the ecosystem and you get proportions of it. In the same way, it's quite similar because by holding the tokens, you are allowing the value to accrue in, in the pool balance and then it increases until a certain amount and then when you withdraw, that's where you are cashing in the, the monetary value increase based on the future cash flow or based on the cash flow at that moment and you can withdraw that profits. So that is one, that is one example of how, where the intrinsic value comes from. At least such that uh, if you are agreeing to be a service provider in the protocol for a certain amount of time, if you've had your liquidity locked in a certain amount of time, you're sort of accruing um, your you know accruing voting power somehow. Mm -hmm. So that is, I think, a tool at our disposal to use uh, time to counteract mm -hmm. the powers that you can get just from pure wealth, right? Mm -hmm.